speak to another. We didn't read literature in the Western Hemisphere, as they say, for 140 years. So this means that we're entering an area, and this is the evidence of it, and everybody frowns when they see those black books, all that in the bag of chips, and um, uh, hoes better have my money. Uh, I see another one, uh, hell to the no, right? And I said, wow, this is a phenomenon, because they are selling those books hand over fist. And they enrich with those books. But what it is, is an indication that we're reading again, more so than ever. And this is another cycle of reading. But soon, as always, we get tired of that content and we're going to require another type of content. So we're getting people calibrated towards being scholastic, towards reading and improving their, 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 their visual, inner visual you know, uh, uh, referencing for what information is. So I'm saying that to say, that although we do DVD presentations and it's, and it's convenient to buy the DVD, it's also significant that we begin to read. Because reading, the books always give life. They can cut the electricity off today or tomorrow. You don't have no DVD player in the woods. But you can have some significant information in your books that will tell you what to do, how to do it, and when to do it. And you can read in the daytime or you can start a fire at night. Books keep giving life. We need caches of libraries. We need, when people die and we go back to the, uh, the, the, the essence, we should be able to leave an extensive library to those behind us because your library is your cache of armament. It's your weapon. So how significant today we're talking about a book that comes from we're going to speak about a few books, but we're going to speak about a book that comes from the corpus of information that derives all from the Torah. So now the Torah and the other Hebrew books are books just like what I explained. Books that you can have with you all the time, anywhere you act, that will tell you what to do, when to do it. Right? And it's a bunch of different characters, and these different characters are operating in different <coughs> worlds. And we'll see where all these concepts come from. And we'll see how it plays into our present paradigm. So now, further, this is the time for people to begin to also not just read books, but you have things on your mind. You have con concepts. You have um, visions. Start writing. And today, I, I hope everyone came with that in mind to be scholastic and to come with your pens and your, your, your papers, because that's what we're going to do, essentially. We've been, we, this is not a lecture. This is a class, okay? So, very significant that uh, Dr. Rudy <coughs> came and spoke about language. Very important. You see, my notes, he cleansed my notes. <laughs> he cleansed them. <laughs> right? Words is everything. <coughs> This, I want to introduce brothers and sisters to a book here, first and foremost. This book ties right into, a part of this book ties right into what Uncle Rudy was talking about. This book is called Messianic Mystics. Let me turn this down for a moment. And this book, is written by a, ge a gentleman named Ido Moshe. Ido Moshe. And Ido Moshe is one of the, uh, the, the handful, two handfuls of scholarly Kabbalists. You spell his name I-D-E-L Moshe. He doesn't anglicize his last name. His last name really means Moses in the anglicized language of uh, English. But Idol Moshe wrote a book on the whole messianic phenomenon. And where does it come from? And in the book, it's very interesting because it points out a blueprint that we see consistently used. There's always a blueprint. We're going to talk about hierarchies today. There's always a prophet, and then there's God. And then we even see that motif play out when they create uh, agendas and create 
uh, various uh, movements, they'll always have a messianic figure and then his vice uh, degenerate right there with him. You'll have like a uh, Huey Pete Newton, Bobby Seale. And if anybody saw my, my DVD I did called Gangsterism in Service of White Supremacy, I show on there how mind control at Stanford University, the, the foremost center for mind control on the planet and, and on the West Coast, was the place where they created the Black Panther Party. And they used the blueprint used by a Kabbalist named uh, Sabita Zebi in the year 1666, around that time period, he created a messianic movement. And this is where, for the first time, the edict saying that you can't study Kabbalah until you're 40 years old came out in Poland. Because this gentleman used Kabbalah and his interpretation of it as a means by which to create this whole concept of the Messiah. Now, a lot of us are oblivious to it, and so we don't even be seeing it. When you're going down Eastern Parkway, or sometimes down Park Avenue, you see big posters, and it says, Moshiach is returning, or will return. That's a mystical, Kabbalistic concept where they've created a persona, a person, and said that he is the embodiment of the Messiah, and that he's going to come back and that your good deeds help him to return. So this is what happens when your, your science gets in the hands of people who don't really know it. Reverend Valentine said in his last presentation here that Kabbalah is not Jewish. And it's very true in what he's saying because Jewish is a term that they, that they have ins, insidiously intertwined into something being a racial marker and that racial marker being uh, European. And Europeans didn't know anything about Judaism until 740 AD when there was a mass conversion of the Khazarian clan and they went down and, um, and took the cloak of African spirituality abandoned their major language and used Hebrew as a liturgical language to begin to start speaking the language in the manner in which you used to speak it in order for them to reap the benefits of what speaking our language entails. Here is a Moorish brother who makes an entry in Messianic mystics concerning what we just spoke of. This brother, this brother said, and this is a quote that Ida Moshe makes of one of the people he's speaking about, one of the rabbis he's speaking of. But the fact that he creates a racial distinguishing marker indicates that there was a race of people who were in possession of Judaism quote unquote, but didn't really know how to do it. And this was an edict, a warning. This was a letter. In my opinion, there is a danger in sending to you this commentary, since it is said that our brethren, the sons of Esau, study Hebrew, and these matters are ancient. And whoever will write anything there, it may, God forbid, fall in their hands. And compelling to conceal and despite the fact that those who study are faithful to us, nevertheless, it is responsible, reasonable, and compelling to conceal these matters from them. And there is also a severe ban concerning it. In any case, I have refrained from sending to you these treatises constituting the epistle of the secret of the redemption. And you, my masters, those who conceal the wisdom and the secret of the Lord is to the fears of God. And he quotes a song. Which is, uh, which is parlance among these, uh, these rabbis. Whenever you're writing something to someone, you always have to have a canon from which you're saying your stuff. Now, how interesting is it that he's saying that keep the stuff of this commentary, and commentaries are generally how we understand the Torah. The Talmud is a massive commentary composed of what's called the Mishnah and the Gemara. These are, one is the commentary and the other is the explanation of the Torah. 
So the Talmud is just a massive commentary on how to understand the Torah. Ironically created in Hellenistic, in the Hellenistic time. So this is when Europeans had a hand of spiritual matters. And this is where a lot of them began to create law, but the Kabbalists among them who sat in what they would call the heckel, the heckles, or the, the circles, and they call them uh, the lawyers, they call them holocaust, right? They sat in these circles and they shared the Kabbalah in order for them to break the law. So the law, the, what, what, is, what is read in one world means something different in another. And means something different in another. It means something different in another. We'll demonstrate over the course of this presentation how, in fact, it speaks uh, about, in the Torah, a distinct place where creation ensued. I know these uh, transparencies are clean. I just got to find <laughs> You clean these up nice, Uncle, Uncle Rudy. <laughs> now, what we're going to demonstrate today is that Hebrew, in the Sefer Yetzirah, Hebrew, the Hebrew language is considered what is called in Hebrew a netivoth. A netivoth is a path. So by implication, sound becomes a pathway towards an end. So now, when you read in the book of Genesis, it says that <clears throat> there was a creation by a deity had one name, but then he, he created something in one world, but then in another world, he fashioned it. He created it in one world, but in another, he shaped it. But they use, I'm going to show you, but we don't challenge the language. We just look at the Hebrew, excuse me, we just look at the, uh, at the English, and, and I'll find the other one. Here's one. Here. We just look at the Hebrew, and we don't, we don't see further. Here we go. Now, move it over. No, yes. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Here we have the name of God as the initial name of God as Elohim. Now, in this biblical verse it says, and create Elohim the Af, the Ha'adim, in Beth Zedan image of God or Elohim. Then it goes and speaks about how he created the woman in his image. Then it goes into how he created them both in his Zedan, his image. Right? Now, I want to show you another verse where this, de this deity does the same thing However, his name is different. His name is different and he's creating in a different place this time. Okay, and here it is. Now look, this, for those who've been studying, this is, this is going to become very prevalent, but we're speaking about the Sefer Yetzirah today. And the Sefer Yetzirah is created by a priesthood called the Maase Bereshit. They centered the entire information based off of the first six letters in the Bible. The first six letters are Bereshit. Those six letters are the entire Torah in total. That's the whole secret is in those six letters. Everything subsequent out of that is nothing as significant as those letters. Now, here we have, it says, and create. Bara, the word Bara, Beth, Resh, Aleph is the same three letter root of battleship. Now, here we have, this is another depiction of, now, battle means create, but here we have the word yetzer. 
Yetzer. Yetzer, Yahweh, Elohim, the, the Aram, and this is talking about the field. This is when, when quote unquote, God created the fields of the earth. So now they're speaking about a, a creation story, but they use two words of the power of what their deity meant. Here they use Yahuwah Elohim, and then in the other, they use Bara Elohim, but it doesn't say Yahuwah. Now, what I want to show everyone is that on the tree of life, in order for us to understand any Kabbalah, we have to first turn the lights on. <laughs> right? Turn the lights on so we can receive this info. Now, I challenge you to keep up because we're going to be real very spurious and very circuitous in our pursuit. Now look, here we have the tree of life. Right? Now, what symbol what symbolism do you see in this? All kinds of symbols. Point some out. Some people point some stuff out. Sun and crack. Skull and crossbones. Okay. Skull and crossbones. What else? Square compass. The compass and the square, what else? Apron. An apron. What else? Check the floor. Way in black. Check the floor. What else? Press. In the press. The moon. Excellent. The sephiroth. The sephiroth. Yeah. Excellent. What else? We see some Hebrew terms up here. Solomon and Hiram. Then we have this. What is this? What does it mean? Patience. They got a Hebrew word that equals 414. That means meditation. But what am I looking for? My Kabbalist. Ein Sof Or equals 414. So what we have here is in a nutshell, we have an image describing a relationship between these two figures. But what happens is, this is all going down on different realms. Because what we're going to speak about today is called descent, the fall, coming down. When they speak about coming down, they're talking about incarnating. So what are the two Hebrew words? Solomon and Hiram. Or, or Hiram. These are two thirds. These are. Go ahead. Aaron is the king of Salah. He's the king of Tyre. Tyre means rock or stone. Really rock. Right? Then, because it symbolizes matter. Then we have Solomon. Solomon also is synonymous with the word perfect or peace. So this is the story of the Freemasonic story of Hiram, king of Tyre, and Solomon. But who is this in the casket? Masonically? Masonically. Hiram and Bit. Right. Hiram and Bit. Right. Hiram and Bit. Who's Hiram and Bit? The master architect. Supposed to be. Right. He's a he's a he's a he's supposed to be a master architect. But now look at where his head is. If this is the tree of life also, where's his head at? In Da. So it says in the text. You have to explain some of that Hebrew stuff. I mean, you I got, got a Kabbalah string like that. I came yeah. here because someone has to come. Awesome. So you, you gotta you gotta give me a chance. Yeah. Okay. A little more time. I, I got you. I'm a novice as well. Well not now. The skull represents Doth, but Doth represents knowledge. 
But however, I think we need to rechange the name because doth means more so intelligence. Because knowledge is really to know something. Intelligence is an operation. Something that you can just sit there and know. You can know that if you cross the street at the red, you can get hit by a car. But it takes intelligence and wisdom not to do it. So here we have Doth, but in this we see a descent, a manifestation of the, the figure of a man, but his body has instruments. No one spoke about these instruments. I don't know if people saw them. And, in and in the story, this personage represents someone who was murdered by three assassins. And these, absolutely. That's like a saw. 414, the brother said, that's like a saw. 414 equals who? Ein Sof Or. Ein Sof Or is a saw. But it also, so then. Let me finish my brother. At the end, brother. Ein Sof Or is a saw. Now, a saw seeks to make himself manifest in the divine primordial point and then creates a dualism and in this dualism they create a son a widow's son a child of a woman from Naphtali so when you hear the word Anunnaki and when they go into the text and they try to tell you the Anunnaki was aliens and all these people and reptilians and all that the Anunnaki that they're talking about is they're talking about you sitting on your mother's lap as as Heru, the mother being Aset. Aset is in the tree of life as X. The word tree means X. So the tree of life is her body. Mm. Now he needs to come. Asar needs to make himself manifest in the physical realm. What he does is he sets up ruses. All type of things happen. There's always a story in the uh, in the Gnostic vein of information where some something goes wrong, and then when something goes wrong, then that which is spiritual becomes physical, and then the physical part is the part that's maligned and looked down upon. Whereas the spiritual is the place that the physical has forgotten where it has to go. So now, in the story. And I'm doing this for a reason. I'm saying what I'm saying for a reason. I'm going to bring it all home. It look like I'm with someplace else. I'm going to bring it right back. The three instruments are sounds. The name of the assassin who hit him across the throat was Jubala. We have an A here. Right? The one who hit him in the chest. Now the one who hit him in the throat asked him for a secret word. Now that, that's stupid to ask somebody for a secret word and then hit him in the throat where they can't say it. <laughs> right? So the first place they hit him is in the throat. You know it's a symbol. Which is Kabbalah. Freemasonry is Kabbalah. Freemasonry is Kabbalah. They got everybody twisted in the muck and mire trying to we are all concentrating on jurisdiction and not concentrating on the spirituality. Now, the Duke of Edinburgh is the grand master pontiff of the whole planet with Freemasonry. Do you want to be under that jurisdiction? Then we have this instrument. He was hitting the chest with a square. Right? This is the 24 inch gauge. Then he was hit in the chest with the square, but then he was hit in the head, which did, which is Jubilo. And then he was hit by Jubilo. Then he was hit in the head by Jubilum, who killed him. Right? So what is this symbol here? Nobody spoke about this. What's that is symbol? It, is it now everybody in the room say, oh. Everybody say, oh. You hear that sound? Say it again like we like we Tibetan monks. <laughs> Say it like get deep with it. Um, the, um. Those are the three assassins of Freemasonry. Simple. And it's all 
built off of a corpus of information that came out of your West African tradition, the Kushai Valley tradition. Everybody say Kemet, Kemet, Kemet is the place where everything came from. Kemet was the place where everything got centralized, mastered, and made into a high science. We had pyramids in all throughout the Sudan. Jehovah, really, Jehovah proper, the way it's used because the Torah is really magical, it's a magical text. None of the people existed. You cannot create. The only way you can say you are descendant of somebody is if you was born in the month that one of those tribes they talk about. If you were Scorpio, you from the tribe of uh, Dan. You understand? That's how your whatever tribe you is, whatever. That's what you from. It's not about coming from the loins of nobody in that book. The book is a book that twists, turns, modulates, and creates this reality. And it does so because what we have here is two dimensions, but what you have is the ability to take two-dimensional space and make it a three-dimensional reality. And the way you do it is by being Jehovah. But you have no choice but to be Jehovah because you are Jehovah because Jehovah is your four senses. And Jehovah is also the four worlds. So now we're going to get into some tree symbolism. So now let me lift this up. Then we're going to get into the alphabet. Now we see the drawing and the motif fits right in. That's it. Right? Now we see the tree of life. Right, thank you, Tom. Going low again. That's too low. This <laughs> He's going in on me. <laughs> impressive, man. What's your sign, Jack? Let's go up here, man. Yeah, me too. Me too. <laughs> me too. Well, I'm a Scorpio too, Jack. Well, okay. <laughs> now, here we go. Here we have Ein Sof Or, and we see it's an anagram. It's very interesting. that astrology is our only religion, man. Mercury is in retrograde in Scorpio. And I got five planets in Scorpio. My little brother has seven planets in Scorpio, and we're born on the same day. So we are the quintessential Scorpio. So when stuff goes wrong, it's really spiritual. You know what I'm saying? It's not. That's why I love Bobby's information, because Bobby makes it relevant to what you think is going awry is really your spiritual development. You know what I'm saying? So, in the motif, we have separated this story in four different ways, but each of the four different ways are four different worlds. So now, I'm skipping and I'm assuming everybody has been reading their Kabbalistic information because the tree don't work unless you add the four worlds to it. There's no sense in just sitting with a tree of life without taking the key and cracking it and separating it into four distinct worlds. Now, the way this world came into existence is that entities or existences of higher dimensionalities created worlds beneath them, endowed those entities or worlds beneath them with a degree of ignorance. That degree of ignorance becomes a chaos that needs to be filled by the volume of something. That volume is your attention. We live within chaos and we are putting it, all the pieces, back in order. We live in a world where all the puzzle pieces is just thrown on the ground and we're all trying to put it together. Then we create worlds beneath us so we can be subservient, excuse me, so entities can be subservient under us. Then those entities create subservient entities below them. So there's a descending hierarchy, and in every spiritual system, they always have you calling on the deities, the forces, and the powers 
of the lower realms first, then the second realm, then the third, and then the fourth. That's one way. And then when you want to bring down work, you start at the top and you bring it down. Now, in Kabbalah, the top world is occupied by one Sephiroth. That Sephiroth is called Kether. Now, Kether, the word for Kether, the, its, its term in the highest realm of Atsaluth is Ahia. Ahia means what? I will be. I will be. Now, check this out, because Kabbalah is also mad. High level math. Check it out. Peace, King. Brother, I see it. Give Brother, I see it more than I can. <laughs> now, we have in absolute, we have Kether, which has a dot in the very center. Now, what does Kether mean? Kether is spelled like this Kaf, Tau, Resh. Now, we're going to get into the Hebrew. Because I, I, I left a system. I want everybody to write this down as to how to remember the archetypes. Now, here we have Kether. Kether means circle. It's translated in English to mean crown, but it means circle. Now, Kether equals, this is 20. This is 400. And this is 200. So we have 620, right, is what it equals. Now, when you do... The math, 414 adds a number to it to become Kether. 414, which is Asar, adds a number to himself in order for him to make himself manifest in the form of the primordial beginning, the place of swirlings, the circle. What's the number that he added up? Let's do the math. Because we want to make 414 become 620, right? 414 plus 205 equals what? 206. 206. 206. 206. 206. 206. 206. 206. 206. 206. 206. 206. 206. 206. 206. 206. 206. 206. 206. 206. 206. 206. 206. 206. 206. Here goes 414. Here goes 620. Here goes 414. Now, how do I get the number that I'm looking for? This is what I do. This is what I do. Look. This is what I do. This is my reread method. <laughs> for real. This is the fast reread. Right? Look. Serious. 4 plus 6 is 10, 0, 1, 2, right? And then 4 plus 2, two right? 206, all right? <laughs> Don't forget, we got to erase that whole part. Right? <laughs> right? Now, this equals this word in Hebrew. 206 equals this word right here. You're going to hear this word, and you're going to hear it, and you're going to say, I know that word. I know what that means. Those of you who know the Hebrew, what am I writing? Uh-uh, not yet. What'd that say? What'd it say? Ra'a. Or Ra. Or Ra. What was in Kemet the symbol of Ra? Sun, solar sun, the symbol we have the top. Absolutely. The cult of Ra used the target symbol. That's how God makes himself manifest first. Then that's the hydrogen atom. And then the hydrogen atom, in its desire to descend, coalesces with others and creates dualities. And this is where the first dualism occurs. Now, all of this is going on in this realm called Atsaluth. Now, Atsaluth, when you look at the root of Atsaluth, it's Atsal. Atsal means the closest to. Right? Now, the second world, we have Brian. Now, this is the world that we were speaking about where they said that in Brian, Elohim is the one that created. And in 
and in Yetzer, Yahweh Elohim created. Now, they said Yetzer. Now, Briah is where Hokmah and Bina, and, I, and I, uh, a sister from California emailed me and told me that when I say Bina, she said that's the incorrect pronunciation. She said it's, it is Bina because it goes with the the uh, Aramaic symbols, sy syllable, phonetic sy sy syllables of I E U. Right. Right. I, you know, and I, I think it stands to say that we say it how we say it until we yeah. learn how to say it right. But y'all know what we saying. You know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> so, so now, we have, now we have in the second world of creation. What we see here is that in, in the highest level of creation, all you have is is one sephiroth. In the creative realm, you have your dualism. This is where Adam and Eve and everybody first goes down. This is where it all begins. Now, Hukmah, the way you spell it, is like this. The, 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 this is like a simplified Hebrew. I'm going to show you all how to do that. Hukmah. Now, the root of the word is Strength, but the end root means what? It means what? Like, what strength? Like, you have strength, but what strength? The indication meaning that the strength, when we metaphysically look into it, when we go into our alphabet, the strength lies in this here, which is the meme, which means what? The water and also the breath form, which is the heat, which is the breath form. But that's not enough. So you ever wonder how those big, big, big cabooses in those trains run, the old trains? They work off of steam. Now, it works off of steam, but a concept of constriction. The pressure is created when you constrict the, the output of steam. If you have nothing to constrict it, it's just blowing hot air, right? When you create the constriction, then you create the motor, the, the power to run the motor. So the power, the constriction comes in this form in the female. She adds constriction, gives a womb a context for the force of masculinity. Now, check this out. Now we're going into the realm of Yet, sir. Now, in this realm, from what we discussed earlier on the DVD, in this realm, only Elohim, only Elohim was the one who was created. Right? Here's his name. Right? Only Elohim. Now, when we get to Yet, sir, which is this realm, which is the name synonymous with the book that we're going to speak about, in this realm, this is the realm where he creates with two potencies. He deals with the potency called Yahuwah and another one called Elohim, or which is also synonymous with Elohi, because the proper term is Elohi. Now, why in Yetzirah do you need both gods? Why, why in one area, it, it mentions God's name in the first chapter of Genesis how many times? 32 times. Now, why? 32 paths of wisdom. Also, what's 2 to the 5th power? See, I took you back to elementary school. <laughs> <laughs> 25. 25. 32. 32. How did you do that again? Two to the you got you go you don't you you multi now we're gonna talk about that. You multi-dimensional the one number by adding the powers to it. You cube it by putting 
you, you see when they say, this is how I remember. E equals MC squared. We know the square is the two. But the Q is the three. That's when you cube it. Those are dimensions. So one number exists in one dimension by itself. When it has to exist in two dimensions, they put two. When it has to be tri triplicitous in its three places at one time, it uses three. And then when you get to three powers, that's when you have your square. Now, who can go outside the square to the fourth and the fifth power? They're saying Elohim can because they use his name. Now, check what they did. This is the ill shit with the math. Barashith is always appears in the scripture. The first letter is always bigger than the rest of the word. So it'll be like this. Barashith. Right? Now how many letters do we got from one, two, three, four, five? Here. We got five letters, right? What does Bina, excuse me, Beth, what does the Beth represent? Two. 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 This is the fifth power. Right? Which equals, excuse me, which equals 32. And this is why they use Elohim's name a number of 32 times in the first scripture. And each of his names represent one of the Sephiroth and 22 of the interacting paths. But they locked us down with that. Because this tree of life that we've been studying is a demiurgic tree of life. It's, it's, it's the fake one. It's missing some stuff. It's missing some stuff. And Reverend Valentine, when he showed how it's supposed to be, Mount Coop is supposed to have parents. That was deep. I was breaking atoms, <laughs> destroying brain cells, <laughs> trying to figure out why the tree sometimes don't make some sense. Then I discovered that the numbers in the Sephiroth, the number that I gave you, 620, is really incorrect. Because all of the numbers, except for seven of the numbers on the tree of life, are approximations. Only three are significant. Bina, Hokma, and Malkuth. Bina and Hokma are prime numbers, and Malkuth is a perfect number. The rest of the numbers are approximations of terms which get as close as they can to other prime number equivalencies. So they set the standard and the rule in the first four Sephiroth, right here, because all of these four equal one, two, three, four. So I said, it gotta mean something to restore it on this end too. So if this equals 80, this equals 496, this equals a number that will restore it to 1, 2, 3, 4 again. Because if it's 1, 2, 3, 4 up here, it got to be 1, 2, 3, 4 down here. So now we want to go into that. I'm going to demonstrate something later with that. But now, let's get back to Yetzirah. Now here's the world of Yetzirah. Now here's the, the term. Yet, sir, means to create. So now, in yet, sir, you need, you need, you don't just need Elohim. In, in Boraya, you need Elohim. That's it. Right? In Atsalu, the, the word of creation is this, Ahia. It's this, I am, I am what I am. That's another way of saying it. Right? Or I will be. That's it. Here, you need new terms. Because these terms have numeric potencies. They are mathematical equations. Now when you get to Yetzirah, they add a new dimension to it. Now check this out. What does Yahweh equal? Yahweh equals 26. Are y'all taking the notes? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Why does Yahweh equal 26? Because what? The uh, rope and the central pillar start at one going down, give you the numerical equation. Beautiful. 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 The brother said he gave up something that's heavy that a lot of people neglect. The 
central pillar, this is the, the central pillar has the number 26 encoded in it. This is the first Sephiroth. They don't count God. This is the first Sephiroth. This is the sixth. This is the ninth. This is the tenth. It equals 26. And I told people before in the lecture, I said, what does 26 do that no other number in the world does? Right? Right? And people was like, this nigga is crazy. I said, it exists between 25 and 27. <laughs> and they said, so what? Right? Let me show you why that's significant. Because in Yetzira, this is the realm where you holographically create your reality. This is where all of the sorcery and the magic goes down in this world. Everything that depends on your four senses coalesces the light and the astral. Because Elohim means El means light, it means power or force, and it has in between it a He. And then at the end it has yaum. Yaum means is the root for water, or it is also the root or the meaning of the word day or a time period. So the he acts as the connector. The he is a window. When I want to see who's in front of my door, what I do? I look out the window. The he is a, a portal, a way. So they connect the L and the Yam, and that's two gods in the, uh, in the uh, Sumerian pantheons, El and Yam were gods of Suma who were always fighting. So they put what's called the veil of, Sh of the Shekinah, which is the letter He in between them. Once you remove it, you get numbers. Remove the He sometimes, you get numbers, you get the magic. Because the letter He, when you put it at the end of a word, it, it no word in Kabbalistic gematria can be primed with the letter he at the end of it. Because it adds that potency of, of five to it. It offsets stuff. When you remove it, that's why in the last chapter, when they speak about all the work of creation, they speak about the creation of the sixth day. Take the he out of the word sixth day and you get 666. The people who wrote the Bible locked us into a perceptual canopy where they can operate and utilize us as the vehicles to fill in within us the value. This is why I tell people, somebody said, I got an email from a brother out in Tennessee. He says, why are you, uh, he thought I said something negative about the Orishas, right? And I said, no, bro, the Orishas are real ancestors. They was real Africans that knew some real science, that created some real rules, that had some real initiations, and that if you broke the rules, you were subject to the oath of what you said. You bind yourself to this world based off the anchor of your sounds and your words and how they coalesce with your intent. So every time, like one of them, uh, one of them, you can't, you can't drink or get high. Now I know dudes in the penitentiary that was born into that, fell victim to street culture, getting high, and every time they get high, they go to jail, because they was born into it. So when you take on these gods, when you are Jehovah's Witness, when you are the, uh, you worship Jehovah, what are you doing? You are externalizing your perception, opening up your box, your square, and allowing the value of what Jehovah means, or whoever controls Jehovah, i.e. Vatican, right? <laughs> you allow them space in your cube, and then once they can sit like Voltron, they can sit in the, the right in the head, and I'll form the head, right? <laughs> Yahweh is the four lions. The one up top is the, is the Yahweh I've been here. Voltron is Jehovah, also known as Metatron. All those words, Tron, Remember they had a movie called Tron too? It means throne. Throne. And only the king can stand on the throne. And the throne, the, the symbol of the king is the crossbones. The symbol of the king is the crossbones. The cross symbolizes the towel. The towel symbolizes the mark. And the mark is the king sitting on the throne. 
See? In the Sefer Yetzirah, it says the seven, out of the seven double letters, shake them, shake the six sides and put the space and put the king back on the throne. The throne is in the center. The throne is the pineal. Right? So now, here we go. Which goes back to that, you know, 620 up there. Absolutely. Because whoever sits on the throne has to wear a crown. Right? Now, check this out. This, these six sephiroth in the realm of Yetzirah is where all of our thinking goes down. This is where all your thoughts go down. This is where you do all your thinking. This is where your fears and all that exist. <clears throat> now, there's six. One, two, three, four, five, six. These six here. Right? Now, these six are uh, the child of a, of, a, of a woman who made her children without God's permission. Thus say the Gnostics. So what is that? What is the woman who makes children without God's permission? Immaculate conception. Immaculate conception. Well, let's go to the Hindu with the immaculate conception and the premise and bring out Kundalini Shakti. Kundalini Shakti, Kundalini is female and she manifests your intent. Come. Everybody's supposed to be, that's deep, that's why. <laughs> that's deep, that's why. There you go. There you go. Because you are always in a state of Kundalini amplification. You come out, woo, 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 woo. They shooting, you turn on the TV, they sexing, everybody aggressive. That's Kundalini all day long. So whatever images that have been supplanted into your cube of space are now becoming manifest in the form of your destiny. So now here we have in the six Sephiroth, these, these are the children of the mother who shaped them, who took what force of the the grand infinite nothingness. You can't even, this is a great, uh, this is something you can't even speak about Ein Sophomore. To even infer on it is to say that you don't know about it. To even say the word, it means I don't know. But he had to make himself manifest so he creates a world of knowing. But the bridge separating the three supernals and the six lower sephiroth is Doth. We're gonna speak about we're gonna speak about Doth in a minute, right? Because Doth is the place where that's the bridge. That's the bridge of Terabinthia. Where they talk about in the movie. That's the bridge. Yeah, Doth is the only reason why we're here. Doth is the pineal. <laughs> the subservient vessel for deity is the pineal gland. This entire body. Your heart and everything is included. What, what do you think your organs are here to support? What is the most significant and most important organ in your body? The one of inner vision, the pineal. That's the one that has the connection to the, the circadian rhythm of the planet. That's the one that connects you to the cosmos. That's the organ that means the most. Without it, you, you, not, you don't even exist without a pineal. You exist vestigially in a false reality, within a false box. Now, Doth acts as the lens by which this all becomes manifest out of Bina, out of the womb of mother. Now, what is so significant about Yahweh? Now, let me show you this. This is a form of geometricizing gematria. Now, Gematria, what is Gematria? Gematria is, it means geometer, or like geometry. It's the geometry of sound coalescing with the numbers in the, the, the numeric representation of these numbers. Now, this here, have people been writing this down? Right, you need some paper in the pen, my brother? Uh, sir, we do need some papers. Okay. Now, now the this is very important. I want y'all to write this down. Draw this out too. Here you go. You got a pluma. 
Okay. Here we go. Now, we got two-dimensional reality, then we got three-dimensional reality. Now, two-dimensional reality, this is one dimension. One dimension. That's one dimension, right? This is two dimensions. Right? Then you've got three dimensions. Now check now, this motif is in the tree of life. You've got one dimension, right? Then you've got two dimensions, right? You can see me over here too, Rich? Yeah. Then you've got two dimensions. Now here, we got that square I just made over there, right? You see it? Yep. Who said no? You can see it? Mm -hmm. There goes the square, right? Mm -hmm. See? So you got one dimension, one dimension, two dimension, three dimensions. Now, well, okay. Now, check this out. How do you get to get from two-dimensional reality to three-dimensional reality? How? How do you make that which, two, what, that which is two-dimensional into a three-dimensional reality? 32 pathways. Really, the central pathway. You use your Yahweh. You use your four senses. You use your four senses to create two dimension into three dimension. Now look at this. Only this is the only place that this ever happens in all the sequences of infinite numbers. Numbers as a magician, you will never lose if you use the numbers. And if you become a math magician, you will never lose if you use the numbers. If I write a book and I begin the book with a letter and I end the book with a letter, I seal the book with the numbers. What's the first letter in the Torah? What's the last letter? What do they equal? 32. The book is sealed within numbers. You can't escape them. They act as the prison. <laughs> So now, here we have the number 25, and we have the number 27. Now, 25 is a square number. 27 is a cube number. Now, this is how you get from one dimension to the other. 25 is 5 to the second power. 27 is 3 to the third, right? Now look, we see these, these numbers, right? You see the 2 and the 3? You see them? Now how do you get from, now when I say this, I want you all to understand. From the numbers one all the way to the numbers a billion, trillion, million, there's no numbers where a cube and a square number exist and there's a number in between it. There's no other place. They use 26 for a reason, and that is the reason. It is the means by which to transdimensionally traverse from a two-dimensional plane on into a third-dimensional reality based off holograms. That's what Yahweh is. Yahweh is nothing more than that. This is how you do it. And so 26 exists here. Now check it. Who's my eraser? Yeah, my sister. Here we go. 26. Now do the math. Let's do the math. How many? Let's make a square. A 
cube, rather. Well, here's a square. This is a two-dimensional square, right? How do we make a two-dimensional square into a cube? We add extra dimensions to it, right? Now, let's count what we began with. We began with one, two, three, four dots. Then we have four lines. Then we have the picture of a square. That means that you can't make a square with this two dots in a line. You need four dots, four lines to make the square. Now check this out. When we add another set right here, right, we have four dots. Now we add eight. Now we add four more lines. Now we got a dynamic, right? Now we do it again. We add four dots. Excuse me, we don't need to add no more dots. We just add, we need to add more lines. So we add one, two, hold on. Yep. Yep. Three 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 today. <laughs> Cold retarded. Here we go, right? Bam. Nope. Nope. For the top. Yeah, you better erase all this bridge. You better do some serious editing. It's Mercury retrograde in my house, in Scorpio. You can't help it. Free read, yes. Okay, now I got a full square. But let's count. Let's count what I created. Let's count what I created. I created with eight, one, right? How many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? Eight. And how many lines? One, two, three, four, right? Five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 12. Right? 12. These it created what? Six sides. Right? What are equal? 26. Yahweh is a cube. Yahweh is nothing but a cube. that you are in possession of. Now this cube has, on each of these dimensions, a sound. And those sounds keep the cube in order. And those directions have names or anagrams of the great word of God, or the great three-lettered name of God, which is not See, so Yahweh is the blind. The last letter, he is the blind. It's really Yahoo. It's Yahoo. And then they create the word HIV out of Yahoo by jumbling it. And then they give it to a nigga to make it into magic. <laughs> and once you give it to a nigga named Magic, it's magical now. And anybody can get it because Magic got it. Because it's magic. See? So they give titles, names, terms to your dimensionality, your, your, your cube of space. And that's what we're going to talk about. Now, this is the world of Yetzirah. This is the world where the cube exists. And this is the world where you can manipulate the cube. You can debunk the cube. You can change its size. You can put whatever you want in it. But your feet while doing it, are always planted in the realm of, of action. That's what Asiya means. Asiya means the realms of action. So this is the realm that's beyond proselytizing and just popping off with the lips. This is the realm where you got to act on what your imperatives are. Okay? So now, let's get into, we're going to go back there, we're going to get into the, the Hebrew. We're going to get into the actual archetypes of the language. Before we go back to where the dimensions, what 
what sounds emanate from the dimension of that cube. Now, I use these terms as guides to tell the whole story that the whole Hebrew alphabet means. Because Hebrew should either be written in columns like this, in 11 letters each, or they should be written in a circle. Because you need, you need seven tonalities. This is how Hebrew really should be written in a circle because it's circuitous, it's a cycle, it's nothing linear. Now, the improper fraction, 22 over 7, equals what? Right. It equals the, 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 the great number, which is 314. How auspicious that the world of Yetzirah, the term Yetzirah, also equals a number close to 314, which is 315. In Kabbalah, whenever you have one letter short of a letter, it, they have a principle where it is the Aleph that stands on the letter. Because the Aleph equals one. So now, the world of, of artificiality is rooted in the use of the circle and how you manipulate the circle. Now, who, who's ever went into the buildings in Williamsburg and you see those mezuzahs. You know what a mezuzah is? No. It's the thing. No. It's the thing on the door. And you be like, damn, we ain't Jewish. What the hell is this doing on the apartment door? Well, my cousins in them live, we used to live on Netflix. They had the mezuzahs on every apartment outside of the apartment. If you look at them, it has the letter Sheen on it. Some of it says Shaddai. Shaddai means Almighty, and Almighty is this number, three fourteen, right? Now the the root of the word Shaddai is Shad. Shad means nipple from a breast. And when you look at the, the, the nipple, it's a circle, right? It's a circle. Everybody like this nigga going to draw a nipple. <laughs> it's a circle with the nipple there. Going right back to the symbol of the primordial beginning. The place of spinning. So now, did everybody write this down? No, no. no. I want everybody to write this down, and I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna just open it so I can get that. Okay. Just get it real quick. Yeah. Right there. Okay, now we have the primordial. I'm gonna read it out. And this is what. This is what the Hebrew alphabet is saying. It's saying that primordial home is the vehicle of entering spirit onto rhythm, the lattice, grid, or the serpent who fertilizes form. So you want to write this down, and when we go further in the class and we start, I start giving up the, the letters and we start going into Sefer Yetzirah, the C the letters to see what they mean and see how they divide it in three different ways we'll see why this is very important primordial home is the vehicle of entering spirit onto rhythm the lattice grid or the serpent who fertilizes form and disciplines the water of life that supports the eye or portal connecting the past present descent of the future so the whole Hebrew alphabet connects from the primordial beginning, the point where we first everything first comes into existence, and describes the final outcome, which is the cross. So when you look at the the, the letter Aleph, what does Aleph mean? Are people writing down the letters as best they can? Use a simplified form of Hebrew if you can't get jazzy with the uh, the calligraphy. Use a simplified form. It's, it's easier, in fact. <coughs> but it's very important that you write this stuff down. Whoever writes it down, it gets, it gets engraved into the mind, into the astral realm, into the fires of, of thinking. That's why the, uh, the cuneiform, they were spiritual why they used to create cylinders in Sumer, where they would carve out the negative space in, in a cylinder and then roll it over wet clay and then dry the clay to create the impression on it. 
So when you write, you create a, a synergy between your memory and the content of what you're dealing with. This is why when we were in school, we used to always have to, spelling words, to remember words, you always have to write them over and over again. Because once you write something, it becomes yours. So now, the Aleph as the primordial beginning is the ox. Then we have the Beth, which is the home, or the house. Beth means house. Then we have the Gimel. The Gimel means camel. The Daleth means door. This is why we have the word entering, door. As we go down, write it down. The He is the, is the, means the window. But the He is the sound, the breath form that the, the, the rook or the energy that we that, that keeps us in alive travels through the breath form. Then the vowel, the letter vowel is the it means the pin or the hook. That's that that fixes spirit to something. Then we get to the Zion. The Zion is the sword. It symbolizes a victory. It symbolizes a the first a level of a uh, of an agreement, a canopy. Then we go into the keth, which symbolizes the grid or the lattice, or with a fence, a fence around something. Then the serpent, the teth is the serpent. It means the serpent. And if you look at it, it's a it's a it's a snake trying to get its own tail. Then we have the yod, the tenth letter. Now the, le the number 10 has always been synonymous with God. What's, how do you say 10 in Spanish? Yes. How? Yes. DS. Yes. And, it's, and it's synonymous with, God. with yes. God, with deity. So when, they, when you get to the number 10, it symbolizes, a, uh, it symbolizes 